Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, well, it's been a little bit of time, but I'm gonna try to do a repair video, one where something's actually broken and hopefully the fix is actually a fix and it's not just something that fixes itself. We'll be working on this. It's a Franklin Ace 1200. This is an Apple II clone and it doesn't turn on. So without further ado, let's get right to it. The Franklin Ace 1200, this is it right here. It's basically the same thing as a Franklin Ace 1000, but it has this double disk drive module stuck on the top. This is essentially what is the lid on the normal 1000 computer, and then they integrated the two disk drives, and then this clips on, and you're supposed to stack your monitor up on the top here. So as you can imagine, two full height, five and a quarter inch disk drives makes the computer pretty heavy. I've previously done a repair on a Franklin Ace 1000 on the channel. It was a machine that I bought locally that had had a mouse nest inside and it had corroded some of the ICs from the urine that you kind of get when you have a mouse nest inside a computer. In the end, I got that computer working though. And one of the things that sucks about these machines is while they have this nice full-size extended keyboard versus the Apple II Plus, which this is a clone of, it is a Keytronic foam and foil keyboard. So there's basically a 0% chance that this keyboard on this machine works. So even when I get this computer working, doesn't mean I'll be able to actually use it until I do the foam and foil replacement. Now, when we look at the side profile of the Franklin Ace 1000, we can be sure that they were not copying Apple because Apple never designed anything that looked like this, especially from the side profile. The whole computer is a lot bigger and heavier than an original Apple II or II Plus. And I have to admit, I like the curvy lines they added to this thing when they designed the top module. It has a little bit of a 1970s styling look to it though, even though this computer was released in the 1980s. To open this computer, it's exactly like you're opening up a regular Franklin Ace. There are these little tabs that you just sort of bend backwards and then you lift up on this entire upper module and then it comes off like that. Now I already have it disconnected from the disk drive controller, but if it were connected still, you have to make sure you don't just yank this out because it will pull the disk card right out of here. Now this is the bottom of the top cover, which has the two disk drives mounted on with the normal four screws. You can see the spindle sticking through right there. And it's interesting, I noticed that they are different which means these two drives are not the same exact manufacturer. It's a bit unusual. The floppy drive interface cables though are just the normal standard Apple II interface. It's a 20 pin connector. These disk drives would work perfectly on a standard Apple II. So if there's something wrong with these, well, I could swap them out with another drive from any other Apple II full height disk drive. With the top cover and the disk drives removed, we can see the inside of the machine. Now things are a little bit messy looking in here because I think these cards have just been randomly placed inside this machine, but let's just take a quick look at what we have inside of it. Now the first card here appears to be a Franklin 80 column card. Now from my reading, Franklin bundled several accessories with the Ace 1200 to make it more appealing compared to Apple II Plus, which I think at the time was the competitor, or maybe the Apple IIe, which of course was a little bit newer of a machine with 128K, well, you know, once you, once you expanded it, that this machine couldn't quite match. So they added in these accessories like this 80 column card here, which is a Videx clone. So this is basically gonna work with all software designed for the Apple II that uses 80 columns. And these other cards here as well, which we'll take a look at. So the next card in here is the disc controller card. And this is a Franklin designed card as well. It is a clone of the Apple II disc controller card, although it's not an exact copy because obviously this has more TTL logic chips on it because I think Apple consolidated a bunch of TTL logic chips into some PROMs, PROM chips that they did not use on here but it supports the same two disk drives, just like on the Apple II controller. And as I mentioned, you can plug Apple II disk drives into here. It's completely interchangeable. And this card, well, should work just fine in a regular Apple II or vice versa. You can use an Apple II card inside this machine. The next card is, well, this is a Z80 card, so it runs CPM. And you notice this actually has 64K of RAM on it right there and a ROM. I'm pretty sure that even though this says Franklin Computer on here, this is actually a clone of the PCPI Applicard, which I recently talked about on a video where I was comparing the Applicard to the Raspberry Pi open source project that can also emulate the PCPI Applicard. And then the final card that's in here, from my understanding, it's got some extra cables hanging off of it here, is a Franklin multi-IO type card. I think this provides parallel and serial 
to this machine. Now it goes in one slot. So I don't really understand about the compatibility of this card compared to using an Apple Super Serial card in slot two and something like a Grappler card in slot one. And actually now I just realized this machine actually has, let me just move it down a little bit. This computer actually has eight slots. So a machine like the Apple IIe doesn't have a slot zero, but the Apple II and the II Plus does have a slot zero. And typically you would use slot zero for the 16K RAM expansion when you were expanding the computer to 64 kilobytes. Now this computer, just like the Franklin Ace 1000 I've shown previously on the channel, does not require the language card installed in slot zero because it already has 64K of RAM on the motherboard, the 48K original memory, plus the extra 16K, which is bank switched out, which is normally what the language card handles. The ROM chips here, unlike on the Apple II and the II Plus, are normal EEPROM, so it's actually pretty trivial to just replace these with, uh, say, Apple ROMs programmed into, what, 2716 EEPROMs, I think? From my memory and the recollection, looking at these stickers on here, I'm pretty sure that these are actually Franklin Ace ROMs, which, to my understanding, are non-infringing with the Apple ROMs. Anyhow, I took a little tangent when I was talking about the serial parallel card. So this card, as I said, it goes into one slot and it has both serial parallel connections. So I'm not exactly sure how that works because most software seems to address the serial or parallel ports separately. Uh, there are a bunch of dip switches on here, so maybe this can be configured for one or the other. And perhaps it can work as a super serial card on its own or both or different modes. I don't really know. But the cables that are hanging off of here, this rainbow ribbon cable here is a Centronics connector. So this is obviously for the printer. And you would obviously just use some kind of a little extension cord to go from this into your printer. And then we have this, which is gonna be the serial port. Of course, this doesn't look like the normal, typical gender of the serial port you would expect, which would normally be male on the computer. But that was a standard that IBM introduced. And uh, yeah, almost certainly, this is just normal RS-232 serial ports. Okay, so let's get to some troubleshooting. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna remove the uh, 80 column card here because we don't need this for any kind of testing we're gonna do. We're just gonna test with this bare computer like this and when plugged into the composite output, which is right here, when this machine is working, it should boot up like a normal Apple II. We should see, I think, a Franklin Ace uh, 1000 or maybe 1200 banner at the top of the screen. Now, one thing that makes me happy looking at this computer is that the condition of what we see inside actually looks really good. I don't see any excessive corrosion at all. It's just dusty and has a little bit of a musty smell to it. But otherwise, I think this computer should be able to be made to work again. I'm pretty sure that none of the ICs that are used, at least on the motherboard on this computer, are custom. So if anything is bad on here, it should be replaceable with just standard TTL logic or ROM chips or a standard 6502. The only one negative about this particular motherboard is that there are no schematics for this revision. If you find Franklin Ace 1000 schematics, there's a later revision of this motherboard that has a lot of ICs or consolidated, less RAM chips, things like that, has some onboard components, like I think the disc controller and maybe the 80 columns is built right into the motherboard. So yeah, unfortunately, last time I worked on one of these where I had some problems, viewers sent in schematics, but they were all for the newer revision. If you just look at the motherboard in the pictures in those schematics, it's very different than this earlier revision. Of course, in the case of this computer, we don't even know if it's a problem with the motherboard because it seems like there's a fault in the power supply right here. I mentioned in the intro that the machine's not powering on, and I think I really believe that it's simply a fault inside the power supply and well, we'll get to any other faults that might be on this machine once we get power to it. First thing we need to do is plug this into the mains and see what happens. All right, so there's a fan noise coming from the computer right now, but there is no other signs of life. You expect an Apple II computer to beep when you first power it on, and there's also a power LED on the keyboard right here that doesn't actually illuminate. So my feeling is that the fan noise that we're hearing from this computer is because the fan is probably a 120 volt fan. It's not a 12 volt fan. And there is actually no DC voltage coming out of this supply. Let's just quickly verify. I've said this many times on my videos. If you're troubleshooting a computer, the very first thing you need to do is verify you have voltage, verify you have clock, and verify you have a working reset signal. So, ooh, it's very musty smelling. And you know what? I'm getting the odor of reefa caps that has failed on this thing. So that would probably be the five volt rail and there is a solid zero volts there. This will be one of the negative rails, looks like nothing. And somewhere back here, I think there is a 12 volt rail and that's also zero. Yeah, absolute reefa smell coming out of this thing. I'm gonna unplug it. Ooh, that's not good. So sounds like the reefa blew on this thing at some point, but also took the whole power supply out with it. 
I've gone handheld with the camera too because I just noticed something that it appears that there is no speaker in this computer. You can see a little bit of the double-sided foam there, that yellow tape looking stuff. That's where the speaker would have gone and it is simply gone and removed. So my assumption is whatever environment this computer was used in, maybe it was a classroom, something like that, they didn't want to hear all the beeps that the computer makes, so they just simply took the speaker out entirely. Going handheld also allows me to show you the color board that Franklin added to these computers. Originally, the design of this didn't require this extra board, but I guess they were infringing on some color patents for artifact color that Steve Wozniak came up with for the original Apple II. So they came up with this workaround board, which is that large circuit board that actually plugs into the motherboard in a couple locations that allows them to generate the color composite video in a way that is non-infringing to Apple. Now, one thing I'm noticing right away is the connector that's used on this power supply looks like a relatively standard type connector. Like, I don't, I don't know the exact brand name of this one, but it's not the same connector that the Apple II uses. So I can't just swap in temporarily an Apple II power supply to test out the motherboard here. We're gonna have to either fix this power supply or use something like this which a viewer sent in, and this is a cool project that takes a Pico ATX power supply. So that's what you see right here. Pico ATX is a regular ATX power supply fed from just a standard 12 volt wall wart. And then this board here allows you to easily connect up the various voltage rails, like the positive five volts, 12 volts, negative five and 12 volts, and send that to your old retro computer. This was sent in by a viewer on a super mini mail call a little ways back, and I only briefly touched on it. I'll put a link to that video down in the description below. But it's a pretty cool project because with something like this, this large power supply, that could easily just fit inside of there, and this would do everything that this power supply does, and it would allow this entire computer to work off a standard 12 volt power input as opposed to 120 volts. So that would allow you to do things like use a little power bank to power the computer up. Like you'd use a little USB-C power delivery thing and set for 12 volts. You could feed that into this and then this entire computer would be running on a little portable power bank. Either way, we can use this as a fallback option if I can't get this power supply fixed, but the first thing to do is let's get this power supply out and take a look on the inside and see if I can see anything that's obviously wrong with it because I think we should be able to get this power supply working again. Now I had this computer flipped over and take a look at this cool aluminum bottom that it has. Serial number of this computer is 15,656. So it seems like it's pretty early in the uh, scheme of things. It is missing one of the feet. But to take the power supply out, just like any other Apple II, there are four screws on the bottom. And you take those out and then the power supply just drops out. I do find that sometimes when you're trying to put the power supply back in, it can be a little difficult to align the screws properly because of course the power supply is gonna drop down once I get these screws out of here. And there it goes. Uh, but one thing I typically do is I just put the computer off the edge of a desk and then I go from underneath, move the power supply into the right position and then get those screws in there. Anyhow, we just lift up and the power supply should be left on the desk. There it is. So I must say this power supply is pretty chunky. It's a lot larger than a normal Apple II power supply, but as you heard, it's got a fan in there. I don't really know what this fan does other than just blow the air around inside the machine because we have vents on the side of this power supply, which is inside the computer, and we have the fan intake, which is also inside the computer. So without any ducting, the air isn't really coming from outside, which means this thing doesn't really do anything useful. It just cools the power supply itself, but it doesn't do anything to cool the internals of the machine. Now, as I take this cover off, of course, the usual precautions apply. Uh, there are dangerous voltages inside of this, especially if it's plugged in while you have the cover off. So unless you know how to be safe working inside power supplies, do not take the cover off a power supply, a switch mode power supply. Let's see how I get this off here. I just get the grommet off the wires. Do I forgot? No, I thought I forgot a screw and I didn't. Oh, I smell the reefa. That's not good. But yeah, going back to the warnings, the high voltage caps on this thing can store a pretty big wallop and you can get a big zap even when this thing is unplugged because the caps can store a charge. So if you're handling the circuit board, just discharge those first. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then do not work inside a power supply like this or leave it unplugged for a long time to let it self discharge. So there's the fan. And absolutely, like I said, this is 120 volt fan. So that's why the fan was working it has nothing to do uh, with the DC part of the power supply. And I can see right here that this fuse is blown. So the fan is connected before the fuse, which means that, yeah, um, this power supply is not gonna work. Now the fuse blew for a reason. It almost certainly didn't blow just because it felt like blowing. It almost certainly blew because something on this power supply failed and it blew to protect itself, which 
that's the right thing. It prevented catastrophic failure. So let's take this board out of here and start digging around to see if we can figure out what exactly shorted on this that caused that fuse to blow. By the way, the high voltage caps, which on this power supply are these ones over here, these are not gonna be charged in this case because the fuse was blown. So that means that nothing was even getting to this. Also, one thing I'm noticing is that neither of the reefa caps look like they're blown. So I don't really get why I was smelling the reefa smell out of this thing, even though, um, oh, you know what? Maybe that one's blown. They are very cracked. So anyways, we'll see when we get the board out and I will definitely take those out of the board. Now, one thing about this power supply that I remember from my other Franklin is this stuff right here. This is some additional input filtering. Basically, it's like common mode or whatever it is. It's to, to reduce interference from the power supply back onto the line. And they would have added this for some interference suppression, like for FCC reasons, something like that. It is not necessary for the operation of this power supply. Now, one of the problems with this design on this board is that these caps right here are not safety rated. And if I recall, they actually have a cap here. One of these caps is between the live and the ground, the earth ground pin on here. And what happened with that is when I plugged this machine, even if it was off into my outlets down here in the basement, it would trip my breakers. And that's because I have what are called ground fault interrupt breakers or GFCI or RCD in um, other parts of the world. What happens is the breaker or the plug you plug it into, it monitors between leakage between the live and the earth. That type of protection in those breakers is designed to save lives if you get an electric shaft and the power flows through you down to earth ground. But the problem is when you have power supplies like this, they're using these caps which shouldn't be there. They should be Y2 safety rated caps. When they start to leak, it will trip the breaker and um, well, yeah. So if you have a Franklin and it's tripping the breaker when you plug it in, even randomly when it's off, it is because of this little board right here and these parts are have gone bad. If that is happening with your Franklin, you have two solutions. You can either replace these components and replace them with Y2 rated safety caps, or you can just bypass this board entirely. But again, if you're not familiar with working on high voltage power supplies like this, I advise you not to do that and to use something like this micro ATX power supply kit here because this would obviously fit inside of here. And the highest voltage you'd be working with with this is 12 volts from a regular wall wart. It's a lot more safer. You can just gut all of this stuff in here and you just need to hook up this cable right here to this power supply and you'll be up and running. All right, let's get this board out of here. Now I got to try to get this big connector off of here and it's really stiff. Ah, oh, that reef of smell. It's very strong. <laughs> It is very strong. There we go. Okay, there it is. There's the power supply removed from the chassis. I just gave it the sniff test. It's this 0.22 microfarad reefer right here. This is the one that leaked. But the fact that it hasn't exploded, I have a feeling that that might be the only fault with this power supply. And what happens with the reefers is over time, these old ones at least, they start to absorb water and they start to become leaky. And if the cap is installed between neutral and the live line, that means it becomes a direct short as it starts to leak. And it goes into a chain reaction where it gets hotter and hotter because it's leaking. It's basically turning into a resistor. And as it gets hotter, that's when it releases the magic smoke. We need to do some testing, but if this is installed across live and neutral on this power supply, then that cap, when it went into its cascade failure, probably is what blew this fuse out. And that's not always how these are installed. Typically, these might be installed on the other side of the fuse, or the fuse is a bigger fuse, so it doesn't blow when the reefa does. But that might be what happened with this power supply. So, okay, first step is let's get these reefas out of here, and I'll put new ones in, and then we need to double check to see if that reefa is across the live and the neutral. So I've done this reefa service on a bunch of power supplies before, so all you have to do really is just heat up one side, and then the other, and you just sort of tilt, tilt it out of the board. And then you can use something later to remove the solder from the holes, like some solder wick or a solder sucker or a desoldering pump. I find that using a desoldering pump on these directly isn't always the easiest thing to do. It really is easier just to kind of heat one pad and then try to tilt it out of the board. The only thing that happens sometimes, and that is the case right now, is that the leads are bent over on here, which can make it really annoying. So you just gotta try to use a screwdriver to kind of lift that lead up, apply plenty of heat, and then should be able to get this out. There we go. Okay. And then the other one, let's get this out of here. All 
All right, there we go. I got that out and I'm sure I didn't get that centered in the camera very much because I wasn't paying attention. When you're working with a 360 degrees Celsius soldering iron, well, you know, you don't wanna <laughs> take your eyes off it in case you hit your fingers with it. If you have some of this braid and it doesn't seem to be working that well, it's because it's low quality and I'd buy some good stuff. Makes all the difference. As you can see here, this is MG Chemicals Super Wick, which uh, I find to work really well. All right, now we go to this other large one. This is the one that leaked. And I'm gonna try to lift the leg here all the same. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and there is the stinky culprit. We don't know for sure if this is what caused this thing to fail, but you can see it's uh, it started its failure mode. Look, it even blew out a little bit right there. Now I've had a lot of refus fail on this channel, but it doesn't usually result in a power supply that shorts out or you know that the fuse goes bad. But I'm pretty sure, we're gonna check in a second, but I'm pretty sure that that was probably the case with this particular board. Here are the replacement caps, 0.1 and a 0.22. I just realized that for the 0.22, the holes are too far apart for this yellow one, but I have this black one which has longer leads on it. So I'll just do a little lead bending and get that to fit in. All right, so the new X2 caps are in. Let's try to figure out if this reef right here, the 0.22 was indeed across the live and the neutral. If we take a look here, we can see there are uh, some traces underneath the PCB here. So right here is the ground lead and we can see that this cap here is actually connected between there and over here, whatever this cap is on, which I don't think is actually the uh, mains because here's the mains input jack right here. And we can see the neutral is up there, it's up at the top, further away from me, and then the live is this trace right here. Which is interesting because if we look at the trace here, the neutral connection there, which it says N on the PCB, it goes down to this connector here, which is for the fan, so it goes to the pin that's further away from me, and then it goes into the fuse holder. So the fuse is actually fusing the neutral side. I mean, it's fine, it, it works either way, but I think it's a little more typical to fuse the live side in case something else has gone catastrophically wrong between the live and the earth ground in this. That would be unfused on this particular power supply. But if we flip this over and we look at the back side, so remember this is the uh, live and the neutral. The live is further away from me now because I have this flipped over. So these two traces here make their way, they go through the fuse, that's the fuse holder, and then they get to right here. And this device here, if we flip it back over, is this inductor right here. Now this again is for noise filter suppression activities. If we put a multimeter to this, it essentially passes the live and the neutral directly through that particular component. Component. Let's take a look at that with the multimeter here. So it's set to continuity. So uh, this is the live here. So it goes through there to there to there, which is the pin on that inductor. So when you look at the inductor and we go from the live pin there over to this side of it, because there are four pins on it, we're getting 0 0.4 ohms. So that's basically um, direct connection. It's gonna be the same here and here for the neutral side, which is flipped over. So this side here, which we know has basically a direct connection to the mains, goes right here to these two pins, which is that 0 0.22 microfarad reefa that was blowing. So yes, for sure, this stinky reefa here was connected across live and mains and going through that fuse. So it really feels like to me that fuse blew because this reefa was shorting out. We can double check though by just checking continuity here across this capacitor here. And yeah, we're getting whatever, 1.3 mega ohms. Let's just take a look at what we see on here. So it looks like uh, we have a couple more inductors, a few MOVs. This is the bridge rectifier right here. So that's what converts the AC mains to DC. And then that goes into these capacitors right here. This is like the bulk storage. And then that is switched by this large switching transistor right here. This essentially this DC voltage is chopped at a high frequency and it goes through this transformer, which then makes its way through diodes, which are mounted to these heat sinks right here. And then through the output capacitors, which is this stuff over here, which is this DC voltage. This box right here, this thing here is what connects the low voltage side to the high voltage side and provides the feedback to the controller which I think is nothing more than a transistor on this old power supply. It's a very simple design. It doesn't use optocouplers, which is what it would be using on more modern systems. It is using sort of like a little transformer kind of thing. It is isolated design because you wanna make sure you have an isolation between the low voltage side, which is all of this stuff right here, and the high voltage size, which is what's over there. 
All right, so I just wanna check one more thing before I test this thing out and put a, we'll put a fuse in there and test it out. These four pins right here are the bridge rectifier, which is this component right here. It's four diodes hooked up in a bridge rectifier setup. If any of those go short, well, that will absolutely blow the fuse immediately. So let's just double check that we don't have a short between any of these four pins. Beeping occasionally is fine. That's just like charging caps and stuff like that, but everything looks okay. You can try that. You can try the leads both directions as well on these, just to double check. So since the bridge rectifier wasn't shorted, that means that I think it's safe to power this thing up. It doesn't mean this thing might pop the fuse again. It still could, because there could be other faults on here. But I'm thinking that this thing is probably gonna work perfectly. Now, of course, when you have a power supply out like this that has blown the fuse, you wanna do a visual inspection and look for components that have blown up. We already know that the reefer is probably what caused the fuse to go, but we just wanna make sure that we don't see any like resistors or other diodes on here that are blown up, because if they are, that could be an indicator of another fault. Incidentally, there's something else about this power supply that people may not realize. This power supply actually can work with both 120 volts and 220 volts. And there's a little jumper lead right here, this white lead. And there's another terminal right there that's labeled 220. And you move this over to that terminal. And then this power supply will work fine in 220 volt countries. If you're buying a computer from a 220 volt country and you bring it to the US, like a BBC Micro, it has a very similar thing like this. I don't think it actually has a jumper link that's a wire you could just unplug. It's something you have to desolder but it's also switchable in the same exact way as this power supply. I'm just continuing to give this board a little bit of an inspection just to make sure I don't see anything else that's damaged. Take a look at that blast damage right there from the reefa that popped. So yeah, clearly it let the stink out. I could probably uh, hit that with some IPA and try to clean that up just to get rid of some of the smell, which I think I'm gonna do before I button this thing up. There's a little potentiometer right here on the board and it has a little bit of a, I don't know, paint on it to keep it from moving, but there's a little transistor there. This is gonna be part of the feedback circuit that adjusts the output voltage of the power supply. Most typically this probably adjusts the five volt rail and the 12 volt and the negative voltage rails on this power supply are all derived from the five volt rail. So if you adjust this, you need to make sure there's an appropriate load on the power supply like the computer and then you wanna use a pretty accurate multimeter. Uh, this one is decently accurate, and you wanna adjust that for five volts. And you will see the other voltage rails changing. That is completely normal. It's just exactly how these types of uh, flyback power supplies work. Now I'm sitting here trying to clean off this gunk off here, and uh, it's not coming off very easily. It's pretty stubborn. And unfortunately, when that reefa blew, it kind of blasted this little capacitor right here that I have the Q-tip sitting on. That cap may need to be changed. That's the little reservoir cap that actually starts the whole power supply up. So if I plug this thing in, it doesn't blow the fuse and it doesn't actually start, I'm gonna suspect that that fuse, or that fuse, that that cap is also damaged from the little fire explosion that happened from the reefa next to it. So I'll switch that out as well. In fact, um, you know what we can do is I'll just test that right now with my meter. We'll just see if it's actually okay or bad. Typically that's the one cap on these boards. If you, know, you don't have leaky caps like this thing doesn't have and you have a power supply that's not starting, that cap is very common to go bad. It's typically near things that get hot. Like there's a resistor right there that probably gets really hot. So that sort of bakes it as well, which doesn't help the situation um, with the longevity of it. But I have found that these power supplies typically are okay because there's a fan, unlike on say the BBC Micro, which has no fan. So I'm gonna suspect that it is okay. Let's see which side is negative. Negative is towards my left hand here. So if I flip this around, it's gonna be towards my right hand. And that is like this. We'll get this in view. We're getting 212 microfarad and the D value is 0.77. I know a lot of people like to look at ESR. So let's look at ESR. Oops, that's backwards. There we go. Let's see again. So there it is, 0.57 ohms, 213 microfarads. And this, by the way, is at one kilohertz. So that seems like a completely acceptable value. And now what I didn't do is try to see what value this cap is. Now, unfortunately, the reefa, when it blew its guts, spewed all over the side, covered the markings. Let's see if I can get this visible. All right, after some cleaning, I can see, and I know you're not gonna be able to see it, 220 microfarad at 16 volts. And we were getting, <laughs> and we were getting 212 with an ESR of like 0.5 ohms. So yeah, this cap is, Totally fine, even though it got spewed on <laughs> my Arifa, it has survived. Okay, let me put this thing back in the case or in the power supply chassis and let's see if it works. All right, I went into my little fuse holder bin thing and I found another two amp, 250 volt fuse. So we'll just pop that in there. And now I think this power supply 
is ready for testing. Now with these old power supplies, you don't want to power them up without any load. So I got to grab the computer. We're going to have to plug it into the motherboard and we'll test it on the actual computer. I know that's a bit scary because people are like, oh, what if it, you know, is bad and it damages the computer. But unfortunately with these really old power supplies, this thing is probably from 1983, 41st week, there's a date right there. They just do not work well unless you have an actual load on them. I'm gonna leave the fan disconnected so I can hear if there's any electrical faults. I don't want the fan noise, like covering up any sizzling noises or anything else that might be happening. So the computer's plugged in. Maybe what I'll do is I'll get the multimeter stuck into the connector there so we can just validate that five volts is what we're getting. And if we're getting something that's higher than five volts, I'll turn it off immediately. Running a power supply with the cover off, it's very dangerous. So do not do it unless you know absolutely how to be safe. So yeah, that's, that's my warning. <laughs> so here we go. I'm just gonna plug the, the mains lead in here, which I think my breaker just tripped. Are we still recording? Yes, we're still recording. Yeah, as soon as I connected the mains lead, I heard the breaker trip over there. And I think it's these caps right here, exactly like I said would happen. Unfreaking believable Yeah, so I have multiple circuits, but I can see that one of the things just turned off right there. But luckily, all of my computer and the bench stuff here is on a separate circuit with a UPS. So it is still working. So I guess I'm going to have to deal with this situation now. It's this breaker right here that has tripped. You can see it's sort of like halfway. And that tripped because of that ground fault that's happening because of those leaky filter caps. So the way you reset these, you just turn it off and we turn it back on. So now that circuit is re-energized. Okay, we're back at the bench, but if I plug that power cable in again, it's just gonna trip the breaker again. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bypass this stuff and let's take this board out of here. Make sure the cable's unplugged, it is. And I just need to figure out exactly how this works. I don't remember what I did last time, but I kind of remembered. I just took these components out of this little board here, which is held on, looks like with three screws. And because the input comes in from the IEC jack, which is right here where my finger's on, these, these wires there, they go into this PCB here and they make their way over here, which go to the power switch, which then makes its way over here, which goes into the power supply, into the mains um, high voltage. So you have a couple of different ways to bypass this. You could just, uh, like I said, you could replace the caps or you could cut these wires and just connect them all together. But for simplicity, I'm just going to remove the components from this board, which there it is right here. So yeah, so it um, looks like the mains comes in right here, goes through this inductor right here, which is this inductor, and then it makes its way, you know, through those caps, those caps are across those different lines, and it makes its way here, which is the output. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove these connectors on here, and then I'm just going to solder some bodge wires from here to there. We're just going to bypass all of this. All right, there we go. All the components are removed and I just have two bodge wires soldered on there. Uh, the red wire is just what I had at hand. That is for the live and the blue wire here is for neutral. All right, we are ready to try again. So let's pop these leads in here and look for that five volt, that sweet, sweet five volts. Let's plug in the power cord again. I'll listen for the tripping of the breaker. Oh, the computer came on. I thought there was no speaker but there was a beep. So um, I wasn't even looking at the power <laughs> at the multimeter. Um, 5.17 volts, that's a little high. Let's turn down that, um, that little adjustment there. Let's see right here. There it goes. 5.02 is close enough. Um, let's see if we see what these other rails are looking like. The computer only needs five volts to really work. Um, negative five is looking good. Like I thought that that's probably a regulated supply anyways. Negative 12 is looking good as well. And the regular 12 volts, which is sort of tucked back here. There it is, 12.0. This power supply appears dialed in. So it's freaking working. So the speaker beeped. I'm assuming the speaker is like floating around inside the case. It probably came off of where it's sitting. So that's a bit scary. Hopefully it's not sitting on something metal. Let's turn this off. Cool, it works. All right. Let's plug in a video cable and see what we're getting 
on the boot screen there. The fact that it makes a beep means that the computer is mostly running. It won't beep unless it's able to execute code, so that's a good sign. There still could be other faults on the motherboard though, like video RAM problems, stuff like that. Switch the input, here we go. Switch it to the right mode, and there it is, Ace 1200 version 2.3. Let's see if any keys work at all. No, as I suspected, I don't think any key is gonna work when you have these foam foil keyboards. No, not even one. Sometimes you get like the odd key that works, but not this time. But that's a great sign. This ring is trying to work. How exciting is that? Let's just turn it off and on one more time. Boom. It is a little dark looking. I am going through the retro tank. I don't know how standard the video signal is on this thing, but I can try adjusting the pot. There's a little trim pot on here, which on this is located right there. There's a little trimmer, just like the output level of the um, 40 column display. It's not like a good test because we can't really fill up the screen with stuff, but I'm going to twist this a little bit. Ultimately, you'd want to show like a text test pattern, but as I'm turning it, you see it's getting brighter. It's looking a lot better with that turned up a little bit. Looked like it was turned down, not all the way, but a lot. There we go. That looks a lot better now. Too bad we can't type anything, but that is completely expected. This computer so far appears to be working. It'd be pretty cool if there was a diagnostic card you could plug into one of the slots on an Apple II and it would like auto start and run some diagnostics without even keyboard entry. So if you're aware of anything like that, definitely let me know. That would be cool to have like a, an automated RAM test that would just like run on its own, stuff like that. Because yeah, without this keyboard working, I'm not gonna be able to do anything more on this machine. So that is gonna be it for this video. It's gonna be part one. There'll be a part two where I get that keyboard re-foam and foiled because clearly we're not gonna be able to do anything more with this machine until that's done. I'm suspecting because the motherboard was booting pretty normally there that this thing is actually gonna work fine otherwise. So maybe in that second part, besides the keyboard repair, we can try out those cards, see if they are all working, those disk drives that were on the top cover as well. I'd love to hear any other comments you have on this video or on this machine. If you had one of these as a kid and have fond memories about it, I'd love to hear all about it. I only had an Apple II Plus and 2C and then Commodore machines growing up. Never had any of these Apple II clones. But I gotta say, they really, really intrigued me. The laser clone machines, like the Laser 128 and these Franklin Ace 1000, 1200 machines were pretty common. Lots of schools had them, stuff like that. But there were so many other clone machines that were pretty unknown. And those things are very intriguing to me. Apple spent a lot of legal effort going after all these clone manufacturers and they were able to shut them all down except for Franklin and Laser who kept making computers for longer. I think Franklin didn't make them much longer than these machines, maybe there were a couple others. Laser on the other hand did make them for longer like Apple IIc clones and stuff. But the whole clone thing is just very fascinating to me. Anyhow, uh, thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling off the side of the screen. You can become a patron too, get early access to videos and other behind the scenes good stuff. Link is in the description. And yeah, I guess that's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.